Mukherjee was recognized by the King of Sweden in 2016. Some research supervised by Sean Mann published in the Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing can be freely accessed. Professor Sherman's elaborate contribution cannot be described by a few words. In fact, his key research findings are of extreme importance uh, to policing and that is the exact reason why evidence-based policing course at Cambridge University uh, became a part of mid-career training program for IPS officers. Uh, that's a matter of great uh, delight. I think some of his uh, students all, uh, also uh, might be attending this uh, session. His 1987 uh, pioneering works on hotspots policing is now widely practiced from New York to Sydney. Another very interesting finding is how procedural justice ensures reduced violence against the spouse in subsequent occasions. My personal experience as a police leader is that such findings are extremely handy for uh, practitioners in advocating fair and procedurally correct practices in day-to-day -day policing. While traditional school of policing is still preferred by many police officers, the most handy tool for police leaders for propagating the idea of uh, fair procedures is research findings in evidence-based uh, policing. Any democratic society would like to evolve evidence-based techniques based on empirical research findings. In evidence-based crime prevention methods, the role of research is very critical. As a police leader from the state of Kerala, India, where democratic policing techniques are in vogue for the last more than 12 years. I am naturally attracted to Professor Sherman's research findings, um, especially on uh, policing for crime prevention, that simply hiring more police does not prevent more serious crime. But directed patrols and proactive arrests do. Let me welcome Professor Sherman to this August gathering of criminal justice experts and uh, practitioners. Sir, a very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much, ma'am. And may I express my special thanks to uh, Dr. TK Vinod Kumar, uh, who has been a champion of evidence-based policing, um, both in his work as joint director of the National Police Academy in Hyderabad uh, and in his own research and teaching and his excellent uh, thesis on the management of public order uh, in Kerala uh, across a very large sample of events. Nothing like that has been done uh, in the United Kingdom or the United States. And I think we have a lot to learn uh, from his example, many examples uh, in India. Uh, I, I am very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today. And um, if I may uh, ask uh, my colleague to change slides, uh, it's going to work better than if I try to do it uh, this end of the connection. So next slide, please. I want to locate what I'm doing here in Cambridge uh, as being surrounded by police officers from various countries uh, who uh, can't be here today because of COVID, uh, but uh, un until March, uh, actually in the middle of, uh, of a class, we had to send everybody home uh, with the lockdown. Uh, 
Um, and um, the other picture I would like to show you is of my uh, two half Indian uh, grandchildren who live in London, uh, who have also been driving their parents crazy for the last three months in the lockdown <laughs> with everybody spending all day uh, at home, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Next slide, please. So the title I was asked to address is The Rise of Evidence-Based Policing. It's the title of an article I wrote in 2013, uh, which reviewed uh, some 15 years of developments in the uh, application of research uh, to policing, what we had learned, uh, what we had um, raised as possibilities, but we're still testing, and many other ideas. And I would still refer to that uh, document as uh, a major source uh, that puts it all together in, in a way that emphasizes the three T's of evidence-based policing that we'll be talking about uh, this morning. Um, so next slide, please. The um, uh, introduction, and Matt kindly mentioned the journal, uh, Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing, uh, this is a, a, an open journal for the most part. Most of the articles in it can be read and downloaded for free. So if you can um, just Google Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing, uh, what you'll find in it is many examples of police officers doing research. We call them pracademics, pra practitioner academics, who are uh, using policing uh, based on evidence to make decisions that can get better results uh, than decisions that are not based on evidence. Next slide, please. So what makes a result better? This is a very contentious issue in democracies, but I, I think one principle that almost everybody will agree with is that if the police manage to produce less harm in society, by what they're doing compared to other things that they might be doing, uh, that that would be uh, the preferred choice. And the question then becomes how to measure harm, uh, but we will get to that uh, today. Uh, and so next slide, please. If we think about the mission of police in a democracy to keep the peace, to protect the rule of law, to prevent harm by the people against other people, with minimal harm by police, we see why there are pro protests all over the United States in relation to the um, feelings that many people have that these principles, these missions were not being accomplished, at least by the Minneapolis Police Department and um, uh, many critics would say many other uh, police departments. The mission of the police in a democracy, I think, requires a measure of harm to be able to put flesh on the bones of these high level principles. Next slide, please. It is very complex to consider all of the things that police do in relation to things they don't do and other things that they're doing, all of which have many knock on effects many long-term consequences as we're starting to learn, even the effects of an arrest 23 years later uh, on a crime victim is now becoming understood by evidence-based policing. Next slide, please. And to be able to hold all of the effects of different police choices in anybody's head is basically impossible. Uh, and in the digital age, it is arguably unnecessary, at least, uh, without the aid of integrative uh, evidence that can help to simplify and clarify the choices that police leaders uh, and analysts supporting police leaders uh, can make. Next slide, please. So usually the key challenge in policing is that demand exceeds resources, not just because of threats of crime, of terrorism, of COVID, but also because of rising expectations. Next slide, please. And there have been historically two ways to manage policing. Uh, in the rise of democracy out of uh, monarchical power, uh, the basic approach was always to serve the strong. Uh, the strong, in fact, opposed the creation of the police in England in the early 19th century. They didn't want to pay the taxes. Um, but once the police were created, 
there was certainly a very strong uh, connection between uh, men of wealth, magistrates, and um, uh, members of parliament, uh, and, and the police. And arguably, it is the old way to serve the strong, because the middle class might like it in the short term until they don't get it themselves. And increasingly, what we see around the world is that policing should serve the weak. Uh, this is a new way that middle classes uh, are starting to prefer uh, with uh, greater clarity uh, because of the strong empathy it provides uh, for uh, children, women, people who cannot be protected by anybody else but the police, thereby creating a big dilemma for those who advocate, uh, as they do in the U.S. today, to abolish the police and replace it with some new kind of institution that has yet to be designed and yet to be tested with evidence. Next slide, please. So the central challenge for evidence-based policing is to make the best decisions for reducing total suffering, uh, a kind of triage decision that is very common and familiar in health settings where there are too many sick people for the available medical care and we have to make choices based on priorities. Next slide, please. The kind of decisions we're talking about uh, begin with the first of three T's, the idea of targeting in which police invest the time and resources of police agencies selectively in order to get the biggest benefits, not wasting time uh, with things that won't reduce harm uh, because that's an opportunity cost. And, and every moment that's spent away from being maximized to reduce harm uh, is arguably a moment that's increasing harm. But the best way to understand that is the second T of testing in which the comparison between two different policing methods, uh, perhaps with the same kinds of high harm targets, uh, can be shown to produce very different results and that we would choose the one that works better or that reduces more harm for the same amount of money, the same level of resources in police time and uh, investment. And finally, when we know what is the best choice to make based on the evidence, we still need evidence on implementation. We still need the third T, which is the tracking of what police are doing, what resources are being applied to what problems, where, when, and how. Making sure that what works gets done. Next slide, please. Triple T against harm is uh, the way that evidence-based policing comes together with the single focus on re the reduction of harm. It's like having a bottom line of profit and loss in a business. Uh, it's not a business, it's more serious than any business, but it is also a common currency by which you can compare, uh, just as in a business, is this line of product more profitable than that line of product? In policing, we can say, is this targeting with the technique we're using, producing more reduction in harm than some other targeting of effort with reduction in uh, harm, but it may not be as big a reduction in harm in relation to the investment. Next slide, please. So at the Cambridge Police Executive Program, which has its 25th anniversary next year, uh, we have been teaching evidence-based policing since about 2008 uh, as the field developed and we could change the curriculum uh, to police from many countries. Um, uh, sadly, uh, we've only had two uh, from India, uh, both of whom were in the first batch of the mid-career uh, training program phase four at the National Police Academy uh, in Hyderabad. And both of them did outstanding jobs in their own research uh, one on homicide and one on prosecutions of, of corruption. Next slide, please. More recently, the Cambridge Center for Evidence-Based Policing has been providing shorter courses uh, in person. And now uh, we're about to go online because of COVID. Uh, we have been serving uh, many analysts and many frontline field leaders uh, with the uh, in-person courses. And we hope to 
uh, provide uh, thousands of people with the online courses because they don't have to travel to Cambridge to gain the knowledge and take the exam and gain the certificate uh, from Cambridge Center for Evidence-Based Policing. Uh, if you want to find out more about that, uh, all you have to do is to go to Google and put in the words Cambridge EBP, and you can see uh, what our offerings look like for both analysts and leaders. Next slide, please. The police who practice EBP, I think, are its lifeblood. It is, as ma'am introduced me to say, a, a growing network of police professionals, uh, from constables to chief constables and directors general of police, 5,000 strong, uh, often led by over 1,000 graduates of the Cambridge uh, program uh, in countries around the world. Next slide, please. And it has become a global professional social movement uh, in, in which we see annual conferences uh, that uh, we had to cancel for this year uh, for the first time uh, in uh, 14 years in Cambridge. Uh, but we also have societies of evidence-based policing uh, that are meeting in, in other countries. Also online, the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing just had its meeting uh, last week. Um, and the challenge will be to continue to have as much, if not more, engagement uh, in a very disrupted world, even as the needs for better policing and better evidence for policing uh, just keep growing uh, day by day. Next slide, please. I want to point out to you one of the heroes of evidence-based policing who has taught repeatedly at the National Police Academy in Hyderabad, as well as in many other countries. Uh, he is now a commander uh, of frontline policing in London in the Metropolitan Police Force uh, based at New Scotland Yard. And in 2010, as a very junior officer, uh, he founded uh, and became uh, the first chair of the Society of Evidence-Based Policing, the first such society in the world. Uh, and he has continued to provide optimism, hope, energy, and leadership to his colleagues around the world, uh, including uh, his coming to India to help encourage those considering founding an Indian-based um, policing society for evidence-based policing. Next slide, please. In Australia, New Zealand, we have another Cambridge graduate, David Cowan, uh, the Victoria Police, uh, who is leading a very vigorous uh, group that has been having uh, online uh, forums and discussion groups about issues like domestic violence during the lockdown and increased concentration of families uh, in the same space. Uh, David Cowan is a pioneer in many other respects uh, uh, in the police service, uh, running experiments in hotspots policing and other innovations. Next slide, please. In Canada, we have uh, a group of officers, including Dan Jones, Natalie Hiltz, uh, and Professor Laura Huey, who have been uh, trying to lead Canadian police in this direction. Next slide, please. In the USA, Dr. Renee Mitchell, who earned her doctorate at the University of Cambridge after she ran her own hotspots experiment uh, in Sacramento Police, from which she has now retired, uh, in order to devote more time to the leadership and growth of the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing, uh, which is certainly facing a very demanding time uh, in this year of 2020. Next slide, please. Well, I think I may just pause here for a moment and see if there are any uh, questions. I should be looking at uh, the chat and I'm not uh, seeing a question at the moment. Um, so uh, unless my hosts would like to intervene and point out that there is a question, I will proceed with the next section. Right. Okay, so we've talked a bit about what evidence-based policing is. We need to understand it more deeply through the key principles of targeting, testing, and tracking, and then come back to how we can master that knowledge. So next slide, please. Evidence-based policing is a method of making decisions. It's not a particular strategy. It's a framework for how to think 
about what strategies to choose and what, what strategies to stop using. That means it's about what works in policing for setting priorities, which is targeting, choosing policies based on testing with rigorous controls, just like doctors test medicines, test surgeries, test public health strategies uh, for reducing the harm of disease. Testing and policing is a way of seeing how much harm we can reduce through different ways of doing policing. And finally, to ensure the delivery of those tested strategies, we need to have the systematic measurement of tracking of the activities of the police in relation to changes in harm. Next slide, please. So um, with precision policing, exactly the right decisions uh, based on empirical research can help us to target by aiming selectively for the biggest impact, the places, the victims, and the offenders that are at the top of a rank ordered list of all of the possible targets, not just the ones we have an impression about, but that the data show us from official records of the police, testing by deciding what works and doesn't work through randomized controlled trials or quasi experiments that, that have a systematic and fair comparison between two different ways of doing policing. That is the essence of testing. We'll come back to that. But it also requires tracking because unless you track what you're trying to test, you don't know whether the test result is due to a failure of implementation, that is police not doing what they were asked to do, or a failure of effect, that is the police did what they were supposed to do and it didn't produce the reduction in harm that we wanted it to produce. Next slide, please. In this big picture of policing developed by the former chief constable of West Midlands Police, Chris Sims, who also teaches at the MCTP uh, uh, phase four in Hyderabad, um, we can think of three things the police have to do to uh, maintain peace and reduce harm in the community. One is engagement and reassurance in the way that is required to maintain police uh, legitimacy. And that is probably now seen as the biggest failure of the police in the United States, because instead of being seen as a way to reduce harm, they're increasingly seen as a way of increasing harm. But when we talk about serial murders, people who abduct small children, uh, people who uh, commit uh, terrible sexual assaults, uh, the prediction and prevention of those extreme events uh, which show how much harm there is to the general public through widespread coverage in the news media or even through hidden harm that is not revealed uh, in some cases ever uh, and in other cases not until years after it's happened. Um, that I think is increasingly seen as the core of policing that all the legitimacy in the world won't work if you can't prevent harm by predicting its most extreme forms and doing whatever it takes to stop it from happening. Um, even at the same time that with the rise of telephone demand on policing, uh, the police could easily spend all of their time reacting to minor events, minor levels of harm that people think are urgent, but in the larger scheme of things are not important. And to have the rigor and the discipline, as well as the rhetoric to explain through reassurance and engagement why the police are doing some things and not others is the biggest challenge the police face and for which evidence-based policing may be uh, the most useful tool. By innovating in ways of doing all three of those things and then evaluating what works, the police may find uh, better results uh, than they could have had otherwise. Although I don't think anyone expects perfection or a way of balancing all of these competing demands without ongoing criticism. The question really is in, in a uh, rational world based on facts, how can we do the best that can be done? Next slide, please. If we talk about uh, the, the three way breakdown that any TED talk uh, might have, the targeting, testing, and tracking 
can each be uh, summarized in three key elements. And so uh, power few is a concept in targeting uh, which generally refers to a concentration of most of the harm in a tiny group of the units, whether it's offenders or victims being harmed or even places where crime is occurring. Rather than spreading resources equally across an entire population, the idea of the power few is to focus, like hotspots, on the tiny fraction that is generating most of the problem. If you can do that retrospectively, that it helps to make you uh, more effective at predicting it prospectively, um, since looking backwards is not going to tell you necessarily where the harm is going to happen uh, tomorrow. Uh, but prediction methods are increasingly uh, accurate in doing that. And with the prediction uh, about where harm is most likely to occur, when and how, against whom, by whom, then we can perform triage. We can make hard choices, uh, just like doctors do in battlefields, uh, about which to prioritize and which not to prioritize. And once those choices are made, then we move into testing, in which we have a sample of the power few, uh, of the high harm targets, and we compare two or more ways of dealing with policing, uh, dealing with a high harm sample. And with integrity, we compare those two methods to see which one uh, works best. I will get to an example uh, or two uh, to hope, uh, hopefully make that clearer. And then finally, with tracking, if you're measuring what your police are doing and they're not doing all or any of what you want them to do, then you need to, of course, feed that information back uh, if not to the constables, then to their uh, immediate leaders, uh, and to take steps to correct the uh, non-compliance with the policy according to uh, concrete measures. Not impressions, not uh, uh, unsystematic observations by going out and watching the police, but by trying to set up things like GPS tracking of where police officers are patrolling, and to look at the correspondence between those GPS measures and where they were assigned to patrol in, in a very systematic uh, fashion. Same thing can be said about body-worn video cameras, which um, in the US and the UK uh, are a problem for police to turn them on. There are officers in Australia who have never turned on their body-worn video camera, and there's not much point in having officers wear cameras if they're not turned on. This is a track classic example of the kind of tracking that is needed with any new policy uh, to see if it can be made to work. Next slide, please. So targeting of the power few, the predictions that are made about who is going to be in the power few in the future, not just the path, past, and the triage for choosing some and not others uh, based on uh, many factors, but primarily where is the greatest harm. Next slide, please. The testing with any sample with a comparison that has integrity needs generally to be repeated more than once, preferably five, ten times. In medicine, there are many randomized trials of the same drug just to see if you get the same results in different populations, especially vaccines. It's going to be a, a central issue in fighting COVID to not only discover a vaccine, but to test it properly and to make sure that it works the same with different age groups, um, uh, people with different physical characteristics and um, other conditions that might affect the outcome uh, of the test. All of that is true in policing as well. What works in some neighborhoods uh, or some kinds of communities uh, may not work in other kinds of neighborhoods and other communities. So we always have to put the testing in the context. We are not dealing with physics. We're not dealing with absolutes like gravity or electricity. We are dealing with things that vary a lot, uh, just as disease does by the social context of how uh, the problem is being caused and how it can be uh, solved. So next slide, please. Finally, with, with the tracking, I think we've had some good examples, but it can't be said enough that there is far too little thought about tracking in government uh, tracking uh, in a way that makes the achievement of the implementation just as important as the alleged achievement of the results, as in crime went down. Well, yes, but it might have gone down 
anyway, and the tracking is essential to understand what role police uh, could have played in making crime uh, go down. Next slide, please. So if we go to Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computers, his principle of targeting was to say that deciding what not to do is as important as deciding what to do. Next slide, please. So I once saw a, an elected police and crime commissioner in England, not a professional police officer. But she was once asked by a journalist how she decided uh, what strategies to prioritize. And she started drawing some diagrams and essentially wound up saying, oh, well, we have to do everything, um, which may be the politically wise thing to say because you don't offend anybody, except if you do everything uh, a little bit, then you never do the big things enough to make the difference that would make harm go down. Next slide, please. The Cambridge Crime Harm Index is the tool that can be developed for the systematic analysis of what to do and what not to do. And in fact, Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, asked the Directors General of Police last December uh, when one of my colleagues, Dr. Peter Nehru, spoke uh, to the DGPs uh, and said, we need to have an Indian crime harm index. Uh, the English one that we developed at Cambridge is based on the sentencing guidelines for how many days in prison are recommended for people who uh, have been convicted of certain kinds of offenses. So even without convicting people for those offenses, if an offense is reported and you know what the sentence would be, then you can give that number of days imprisonment to that offense type. You can give, in effect, a weight. How heavy is this crime? Because all crimes are not created equal. We have this principle of weighting the harm from crime as a way of creating a common currency, a bottom line that can apply across offenders with all the different offenses they've ever been charged with, uh, places with all of the different offenses reported in a place, and the same thing with victims who have suffered different kinds of crime. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the Royal Courts of Justice in London. This is where the sentencing guidelines are developed. They are developed under the democratic framework of the parliament and the um, government uh, charging the sentencing council with the responsibility to determine the recommended starting point for sentencing before considering mitigating or aggravating factors. And with the legitimacy of the courts of justice deciding how harmful a crime is, rather than having the um, people who might be taking surveys, uh, having a committee of police officers deciding this is more harmful than that, uh, this is a good independent way of citing the authority of the courts and the sentencing guidelines in saying this is the basis of our harm index. Next slide, please. So our premise, not all crimes are created equal. We take each offense type. We multiply each crime of that type by the number of days in jail the sentence would be imposed for if somebody was caught and punished. <coughs> the state sentencing guidelines, the national guidelines, uh, the starting points without any prior offending taken into account or circumstances uh, are a kind of pure measure of the harm of the crime itself. And you can add together all of the days in recommended imprisonment across any units of analysis, offenders, places, or victims. Next slide, please. Dr. Nehru, my colleague and former PhD student uh, who has been chief of two police agencies in the United Kingdom, was also a member of the Sentencing Council of England and Wales. Uh, most of the other members are senior judges, uh, but uh, he uh, has worked with me to develop and persuade the Office of National Statistics and many other agencies in the UK that this is a better way to count crime uh, than the ways we've done it 
traditionally. Last week, we published a seven series recommendation that would separate proactive policing of, for example, drunk driving uh, or drug enforcement, which really depends on the priorities of the police rather than sampling the absolute level of drug offenses or drunk driving in the population. So we recommend it shouldn't be counted as a crime. We recommend it should be counted as policing, uh, which is fair and it gets it separated and put in a place where people can understand it. Uh, just as with uh, a number of other clarifications that you will read if you simply go to the Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing uh, and look for the article published just last week uh, by me and Cambridge Associates. It's been endorsed by leading statisticians as well as by members of the House of Lords who were formerly uh, head of Scotland Yard, uh, as well as many other chief constables as a more rational way to produce crime statistics for uh, the United Kingdom. It hasn't been fully adopted uh, across the nation, but Scotland Yard and other agencies are increasingly using it uh, as a way of making decisions, as a way of deciding whether their performance is maximizing the reduction of harm. Next slide, please. One way to illustrate the value of this is the study done by Gavin Dudfield in Dorset in England, who looked at one year of all crime reports, over 30,000 crime reports in a relatively small uh, county of Dorset. And he found that under 4% of the victims had um, accounted for 85% of all the harm done to victims using the Cambridge Crime Harm Index. Now, this is a stunning number because the police themselves had not realized that so much harm was concentrated on so few victims. And some of them were uh, teenage girls who had been raped repeatedly. And the crimes had been reported to different officers. And the fact that this was a repeat victim had not registered uh, in the systems, uh, which were not set up to detect this kind of pattern. Um, but when he applied the Cambridge Harm Index uh, principle to targeting the power few of the victims suffering the greatest harm, he was able to refocus the efforts of the Dorset police to predict who is likely to be harmed and how it might be best uh, prevented. Of course, much harm is not going to be predictable, uh, but that is no reason not to try to predict what can be predicted and to try to prevent on the basis of that prediction what can be prevented. Next slide, please. In the curve that you see here, um, first identified by an economist named Vilfredo Pareto uh, about a century ago, the uh, distribution, which looks to some like a hockey stick, uh, shows you that in this small group over on the far left, the number of victims in Dorset who produced the 80-85% uh, of the harm. And so the additional harm suffered by all the other victims uh, to which we uh, must be uh, showing concern, uh, they certainly did not um, bear as much investment in each case as those who were in the very highest harm group over on the far left. Uh, next slide, please. If we now start to try to predict offenders who are going to be harmful in the future, based on the kind of pattern of harm they have had in the past, uh, we have an opportunity for the uh, big data, uh, artificial intelligence and algorithmic analysis to compare its accuracy to the experience and judgment of the officers managing the custody suites, one of which is illustrated here in the picture, uh, where everybody who is arrested is taken uh, at a police station and where bail decisions are made, um, other decisions about prosecution are made, and the decisions are often made on the basis of the risk assessment of how dangerous the offender is. Um, up to 30% or more of all sanctions are imposed in the station house in England and Wales, um, where that's the final disposition. It creates a criminal record. Uh, but it also lets the offender go. 
And so helping these decisions to be made in a way that is not only best for justice, but also for public safety is something that evidence-based policing uh, has been able to do in Durham, uh, where uh, uh, an algorithm based on over 100,000 offenders was able to say with 97% accuracy who was not a very dangerous offender. Um, and it was also uh, able to say that the um, people who were dangerous offenders were identified twice as often um, as by the sergeants who were making these same decisions without the benefit of the big data algorithm. And with that increase in accuracy of identifying very dangerous people before they're let go, as well as the accuracy of uh, identifying low risk people uh, who can be processed uh, much more quickly and much less intrusively, much less time in the police station as a source of harm that has often been criticized, especially in communities where people commit suicide in jail from the psychological so shock of being taken to a police station. All of this is a potential way for decisions to be made about offenders that could in principle be transferred by phones uh, to the constables out in the field. And when they're interacting with people in the field, you might even see a thumbprint being put on the phone to identify somebody as very dangerous uh, or not, not so dangerous. A video that uh, describes how this was built and uh, how it operates uh, in Durham uh, can be found uh, on these slides, which uh, I'm inviting uh, our sponsors for this event to circulate to all of you so that you can watch that video and also so you can access the uh, Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing. Next slide, please. So in Philadelphia, where some of this research was first developed, the analysis of people's level of risk of committing murder, if they were sentenced offenders, um, not in prison, but on community sentences under supervision of probation officers, the uh, population turned out to have only 2% who are at high risk of committing murder. That was based on a two-year follow-up of the predictions made based on two years uh, prior to the beginning of their sentence in the community. And that 2% um, was the group that the probation office decided to focus most of their work with, um, with some work on the medium risk, those who were neither high nor low, uh, but with 60%, um, and the triangle doesn't show that proportionally, 60% of the probationers who were low risk who were given very low levels of resources at all. Next slide, please. So the average charges for murder in those three groups demonstrate how big the level of risk was. Uh, in the high risk 2%, um, there was about 37% of them were charged with murder or attempted murder in the next two years. Um, so that's a pretty good prediction compared to the um, lowest risk group, uh, which I'm not sure you can see it on the screen, uh, but it should be uh, about 0.5%. Uh, um, and the, um, uh, the fact that the medium risk group was right in between also showed that the high risk group was 10 times more dangerous, 10 times more likely to commit a homicide or an attempted homicide uh, than the medium risk group. So the value of setting priorities uh, on predicting and preventing uh, who will be the most dangerous offenders is increasingly established through not only this kind of prediction work, but again, comparisons to the subjective, the clinical, um, I've, I've had a lot of experience with offenders, this guy's not dangerous, or this guy is dangerous. When you compare that to computerized analysis of hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of cases even, what you see is that the computers actually do a better job and we can make better use of police resources if we're using that kind of statistical evidence. Now with the digitization of uh, national identity with uh, computers uh, in every police station across uh, 15,000 or so 
uh, in places like India, we have the opportunity to do these things in ways we've never done before. Next slide, please. Now, in Tokyo, you have a very nice picture of the hotspots of violent crime. This picture shows you how much more crime per square foot uh, there was in Tokyo in 2005 in some locations than others. And clearly, you're seeing a vast plain in which there's basically no violent crime. And if you want to deal with violent crime by prevention, the place to assign more police is those mountains of violent crime counts. Um, when that information was shown to the Tokyo police commanders, they said, thank you very much. That's a nice picture. Um, and they didn't change any of the patrol patterns. The patrol pattern they had was to spread the patrol equally, evenly, right across Tokyo, rather than putting the greatest resource investment where the crime is most concentrated. Uh, my, my colleague uh, Sumit Kumar uh, has uh, done similar maps for Jaipur uh, in Rajasthan, and um, some of the distinctions are uh, even greater than what you see in, in Tokyo. So at least with the reported crime uh, in India, which uh, may be growing as a percentage of all crime, uh, we have this ability to um, locate the highest risk places, just like we can identify the highest risk offenders and the victims who suffer the greatest harm. Next slide, please. Now, this slide shows us the difference between crime counts, which is what I showed you in Tokyo, and crime harm. So the harm spots in Birmingham, England, uh, produce harm levels that look much higher because you're multiplying the seriousness of the crime by the number of days in prison. Um, and more importantly, you're getting different locations with high harm than you are just with high counts of crimes as if all crimes were created equal. There is some argument for using both kinds of maps. Uh, and incidentally, this is architectural software in, in which the red pieces are rising from the ground um, based on, uh, on the left, the number of crimes that occurred at each address, and on the right, the number of crimes times days imprisonment for each crime uh, reported at that address. Um, using both of these methods uh, might be able to identify um, the indoor crime that might be associated with sexual assaults or other crimes that drive up the harm level, or even uh, street violence of stabbings or shootings uh, that um, could also be prevented uh, by patrol. But to be able to have this kind of map on an ongoing basis to guide uh, police operations uh, creates a new possibility for proactive policing uh, that can be controversial if there is not a clarity with the public about what's the basis for that decision making. And so what my um, recommendation is always to do with these kinds of maps is to make them public. But they are not typically communicated in the news media. Somehow uh, police in the US or the UK feel that uh, this information shouldn't be disclosed. Uh, real estate prices might be affected by it. Uh, my own view is that in public health, if we were looking at the rates of COVID death or the rates of uh, HIV or hepatitis from uh, needles, we would want to use the same kinds of maps. And I commend them to you at least for internal decision making, if not for public discussion as well. Next slide, please. This kind of mapping looks backwards at where the crime and harm occurred. Um, and which sometimes runs into the problem that what was high last year is not going to be high next year. Um, and so what we need to do is develop additional methods for predicting into the future, just as we did with the high-risk offenders, uh, where uh, and when uh, the places and victims of highest harm are likely uh, to be in the coming year. And indeed, of, of the individual offenders who uh, may not be in a station house or in police custody. 
Next slide, please. That means that we have to understand not only how to target, but also to test. And some of you have been asking on chat about the testing. It's systematically comparing two methods for dealing with the same kind of police problems and asking which one works better, which one, which strategy costs less, which strategy gets the best result for the same cost. Uh, and one key example I'd like to give you uh, is the West Midlands Police Turning Point Experiment. Next slide, please. Now, in this experiment, the results of uh, not prosecuting uh, offenders, and we've had lots of discussions about this uh, at the National Police Academy in India, if you have the evidence and you can prosecute offenders, but you don't prosecute, we found that uh, compared to standard prosecution, giving an offender uh, a, a reform and re rehabilitation plan supervised by the police on a voluntary basis, the offender agrees to do it if he's not prosecuted, that has reduced crime harm by the offenders by 36% compared to prosecuting them. It has increased the consequences imposed on them by 34% because prosecution so rarely leads to actual punishment uh, by the courts. And overall, it has reduced the cost of justice by 45%. So how do we know that? Next slide, please. We know it because we took 414 first or second offenders that the police decided they had evidence to prosecute. And we randomly assigned half of them not to be prosecuted, but instead to have an offender manager, a police constable, who would agree with the offender that they needed to get drug treatment or alcohol treatment or get a job or get anger management or some other kind of program. And comparing the 208 who were prosecuted to, to the 206 who were not, we were able to answer which one has less crime and less cost. Next slide, please. This police-led randomized controlled trial was called Operation Turning Point. The sample consisted of first and second offenders uh, whom police decided to prosecute who were low risk with no previous convictions or one prior conviction uh, more than five years ago if they were adult or two years ago if juveniles. And the offense was not likely to result in a prison sentence anyway. So by randomly assigning them to prosecution or rehabilitation by the police, they developed and tested a standard protocol of tactics for instant police offender management before uh, anybody was charged. Um, if you go to the next slide, you see that in this, next slide, please. In this sample, we had about half of the cases were violent crimes not serious violent crimes, but they were violent. Another uh, almost half was 45% uh, of property crimes and uh, about 15% involved drugs one way or, or another. Uh, next slide, please. The reduction in crime harm went from an average of 134 days of recommended imprisonment across all offenses over two years for those who were prosecuted. So these are new offenses after they were prosecuted compared to the turning point average of only 87 days of total recommended time imprisonment associated with the crime uh, for each offender uh, in the group that did not get prosecuted, the blue group. Next slide, please. In total days of imprisonment, and this shows you how the crime harm index creates equivalent, uh, equivalence. The, um, the amount of crime total across 208 people who were prosecuted uh, was uh, 27,872 days uh, of recommended imprisonment equal to 76 years of imprisonment among the 208 people. And that in sentencing guidelines terms was the equivalent of five homicides or 76 robberies or 15 rapes uh, or um, uh, 1,300, almost 1,400 burglary of dwellings. But with the turning point, 
uh, and only 17,922 days of recommended imprisonment, it was the equivalent of preventing two murders or of preventing 27 robberies or of five fewer rapes or 500 fewer burglaries. Now, that's the kind of currency that people understand that uh, across a group of, of 200 offenders, if you do prosecution, you're going to have more crime and more homicides potentially, or the equivalent of more robberies or burglaries, than if you don't prosecute and you put them into an immediate police supervised rehabilitation uh, program. This finding is the kind of thing uh, that can persuade people not just to adopt a different strategy, but also to adopt a different system of measurement for evidence-based policing, the currency of a crime harm index. Next slide, please. In terms of the consequences measured by the offenders actually going to the rehabilitation program compared to actually showing up in court uh, or having any kind of sanction or fine imposed on them in court, uh, the justice of having some consequences for doing something bad was also served better by not prosecuting than by prosecuting. And the key point there is that because of the legal impediments to imposing any consequence on offenders, uh, the uh, irony of the legal system is that it has uh, become incapable to do what it was intended to do, uh, and that the way to get justice to be served is to stay out of the legal system by consent of the suspect, the defendant who agrees uh, to do something else in order to not be prosecuted, uh, given the risk and inconvenience associated with the prosecution. Um, let me uh, just make a further point. It's not in this slide, but uh, which uh, Sumit Kumar, my colleague, has discovered, that in England, this works even better for South Asians than for um, uh, native-born uh, English or traditional Anglo-Saxon English people uh, or Black African, uh, Afro-Caribbean. Uh, this idea of not prosecuting, not having the shame of prosecution, seems to be effectively uh, much more powerful with South Asian culture, at least in the English context. So I think the generalizability of this to other South Asian uh, populations could indeed be very high. Next slide, please. Just to show how much justice was done with the prosecution, you can see that uh, a third of the cases were dismissed or uh, withdrawn or found not guilty. Another 10% conditional discharge um, and um, uh, the uh, fine or community order of referral to do some work, uh, that was only 40% of uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 50% of the outcome uh, with some imprisonment and suspended imprisonment. So not much happening for the average offender who is prosecuted, whereas every offender who took the turning point approach had to do something and had to do it right away. Next slide, please. What about victims? Do victims like the idea that their offender is not prosecuted? Well, in England they did because they were essentially dissatisfied with court. Only 50% of them were satisfied when the offender was prosecuted. Um, but if the offender was not prosecuted, 73% were satisfied when they were told that instead of being prosecuted, the offender was going to get a program to try to stop their criminality from developing. And they strongly supported that uh, in a very diverse city of uh, people of diverse background, including South Asians, Afro-Caribbeans, and English. Uh, Anglo-Saxon populations. Next slide, please. The cost of justice overall for the cases prosecuted uh, was 366,000 pounds compared to the police supervised rehabilitation, uh, which only cost 200,000 uh, pounds. So uh, about 45% less total cost by not prosecuting and uh, that really means freeing up time for the police to do other things, freeing up time for police to patrol hotspots or to um, monitor high-risk offenders 
or to check up on high harm victims and do other things that can make more difference in preventing harm. That's what evidence-based policing can allow you to do. And you don't have to work it out in your head as much as look at the data and track the offending and victimization that is reported in any police service. Next slide, please. And that, again, gives you a graphic uh, view of the saving of 330,000 pounds across 200 offenders who were not prosecuted. Next slide, please. With the average savings per person, 700 pounds, uh, the police costs alone uh, were 25% lower. Uh, the other numbers included the court costs and the total cost to the public. But a 25% reduction in police costs should always be welcome as well, especially with less crime coming out of less cost. Now, other kinds of testing uh, are all over evidence-based policing. There are now 78 randomized trials or strong quasi-experiments with control groups of hotspots policing, comparing what happens when you put more policing in some hotspots to uh, not putting extra policing. And incidentally, most of them have shown there was no displacement of crime. It does, doesn't get pushed around. It actually goes down overall. Uh, we've had tests of different ways of policing domestic abuse, um, including arrests and then post-arrest workshops um, with very complicated results, very worrying results in some ways that uh, arresting uh, an offender may cause long-term uh, early death to the victims, not from violence, but from heart attacks and stress and shame over having their uh, husband uh, arrested. Catching repeat offenders, we have experiments showing that if you take uh, 200 active offenders and you have the police follow 100 of them and not the other 100, you vastly increase catching them in the act and being able to prosecute them and send them to prison with that. And on the other end of the strat strategic perspective, way away from imprisonment, we have meetings, restorative justice conferences of victims and offenders led by the police. Um, which have been very uh, effective in reducing repeat offending, as well as in reducing the trauma and psychological damage that victims have suffered from certain kinds of crimes. Um, door knocking on burglars uh, who are known to be committing burglaries, but uh, to give them the focused deterrence that they better not get caught um, because the police will maximize uh, the consequences. Uh, this has also been tested and demonstrated to be a way to reduce burglary um, in the areas where it's used. Next slide, please. We now uh, come to the matter of tracking, which is something you need in every test uh, to find out what police were really doing, where and when, um, what crime was really happening, to whom, uh, and on what basis, and then how the connection between the police activity and the crime uh, was changing over time. This is something that can be done as a routine part of managing police resources at the police station level uh, anywhere in the world. And increasingly, it is being done uh, in various parts of the world. Next slide, please. And it shows how important it is for evidence to be used even at the lowest operational level. Um, that's a picture of a sergeant uh, in West Midlands. He was later hired by the Western Australia Police and is now head of the evidence-based policing unit of 40 constables and inspectors uh, in New Zealand, um, where he works in Auckland, uh, continuing to do experiments uh, for the New Zealand police. His first experiment for his thesis at Cambridge was to answer the question of how often should foot patrols visit hotspots. His question was, is it better to have more visits in the course of a day that don't take as long, five minute visits perhaps, uh, police often complain about having to stay in a hotspot for 15 minutes, which had been the previous research standard, or should there be fewer visits uh, of uh, a longer time period like 15 minutes? So 
three visits a day to a hotspot for 15 minutes each versus nine minutes a day uh, for five minutes each to the same hotspots. And the way he did this was entirely dependent on tracking by using the data from the police radios to determine whether they were inside what's called the geofence, the area of electronic measurement of police being inside a hotspot of crime. Next slide, please. By using that uh, measurement uh, with the uh, tracking to assure us that there was more, um, I think I'll continue to tell you about this experiment because it was very interesting to see that uh, actually they uh, had about the same amount of patrol time on the days in which there was supposed to be short visits versus longer visits. And that patrol time, if we can go to full screen, um, was supposed to be five minutes at a time uh, on half the days, about 50 days, the same seven hotspots that uh, foot patrols would go to every day. They always had the same amount of time. It's just that they had uh, an average of three visits on 15 minute days versus um, five minutes uh, uh, visits nine times on the five minute days. And what you can see here is that there was less crime when they came less often and stayed longer. And can we go back to full screen, please? Full screen, please. Full screen, please. Thank you. So with the level of crime counts and antisocial behavior lower on the days when the police stayed a full 15 minutes for each visit, we came up with clear empirical evidence that it's when the police go to a hotspot, they shouldn't just look around and say, nothing's happening and they leave, which is part of the nuance of how you actually carry out uh, a police strategy with tracking. And it shows you that the third T of tracking is absolutely essential to reduce harm and reduce crime from the targeted police patrols in high harm locations. Next slide, please. So the experimental design, uh, 100, 100 days across seven hotspots, they were assigned um, 57 days actually by random assignment to have the 15 minute patrols three times a day and another 43 days assigned to have the five minute patrols nine times a day, which were called the uh, pop-up patrols. The Coper patrol of 15 minutes refers to Chris Coper's study showing 15 minutes was optimal uh, in the Minneapolis uh, uh, hotspots experiment. And the, um, the cases of, of crime within those geofenced hotspots uh, is what were related to the tracking of the, the police uh, data. Um, with uh, any kind of measurement, this approach could be used to see what is the most effective way to patrol hotspots in India, which have been clearly uh, identified in various studies in locations uh, across uh, India, uh, as well as in Hong Kong and many other kinds of uh, cities with different crime patterns. Next slide, please. So the, um, the question of whether sergeants know uh, how much time people are spending on their posts, police community service officers or the PCSO, uh, is the fundamental point about tracking. Let me give you another example about tracking. Next slide, please. Are the guidelines being followed? Where are the police? What are they doing? What are the trends in their resources, their activities, and their results? These are all the issues. Next slide, please. And with the automatic, automatic number plate recognition, the cameras that have a hit whenever a uh, license number, uh, a plate on a car goes by, and that car is wanted for some reason, um, what we see in the um, next slide, please, especially if we can go to the full screen. Okay, so uh, Chief Inspector Baljeet Sidhu 
of the West Midlands Police in Birmingham showed that when the, the dispatchers decided not to send a police car, if the camera saw a wanted car, uh, they were um, ignoring uh, crimes of 112 days imprisonment on average compared to the cars they sent response, sent a rapid police car out at high speeds to stop a car on the highway, but for only 60 days of imprisonment. In other words, they were targeting the wrong crimes and not having the information as to what was the crime level in crime harm index terms. It was understandable that the dispatchers had no basis to make a better decision. What was shocking was how much worse their decision was uh, than a decision that could have been made by a computer or, or a robot that would simply take the algorithm of what was the harm level of the crime for which that car was wanted by police. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. We see that whether uh, the car got intercepted, uh, again, um, was not related to the harm. It was related in the opposite direction, in fact, so that the cars that were intercepted were less harmful than those that were not intercepted. And then finally, taking some criminal justice action um, <clears throat> was uh, associated with much lower harm levels rather than higher harm levels. So here we have a clear example of how just tracking with the crime harm index can help us assess whether our resources are being used in the way that would help to maximize the reduction of harm, or at least the punishment of high harm. And a good example there, which Scotland Yard is about to use, why look at the detection rate? Why look at the percentage of all crimes that results in a police making an arrest when all crime is not created equal? Why not create an incentive for police to go after offenders for high harm crime and look at the percentage of harm that is cleared uh, by arrest. That percentage of harm is something that would be a much more meaningful measure of whether police are doing the utmost to fight harm and not just to treat all crimes as created equal, which nobody would think they are. It's just that we've been doing it that way for 150 years and it's time to stop, which is why Prime Minister Modi has asked to focus on a crime harm index uh, if one can be developed by agreement of police uh, in countries like India uh, to adopt that new method and to explain it to the public at the same time. So hold on to that. Many people think that online education involves just looking at videos that are pre-recorded. I want to stress that if you want to work with evidence-based policing uh, with a tutor who will speak to you in live time by Zoom or Skype or WhatsApp or some other way of having a conversation with exercises about how to analyze data sets that uh, can help to target, test, and track uh, police activity. The Cambridge Center for Evidence-Based Policing uh, is now established to do this online. And if you go to the next slide, please, uh, to slide 69, Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, we have these courses separately arranged for analysts with many computational exercises and also for operational leaders without the computational exercises so they know what to ask the analyst to do. Uh, we provide this in a way that's accessible to all ranks and all educational backgrounds as long as people have uh, good written and spoken English skills. Uh, and we do have face-to-face -face courses that uh, uh, can be relatively short as a uh, introduction to evidence-based policing. Um, we, we can and do deliver that to the um, mid-career training program for IPS senior officers in Hyderabad. We could do it in any of the states uh, in India uh, or other locations around the world as we have done. Um, but increasingly, we're uh, going to uh, encourage people, given costs and other issues, to look at our online courses, uh, which using the uh, two uh, online tutors who do the assessments at the end of the course, you will earn through a rigorous uh, 
um, demonstration of your knowledge, a certificate from Cambridge uh, that would, uh, I hope, have recognition within uh, policing in terms of demonstrated competency. And the way to find out about all this is just to Google uh, Cambridge EBP. Uh, I think um, I have one more slide. And that's what I would have to say to you, uh, unless, uh, uh, Dr. Sadia, is there any other question uh, or um, uh, task that I can deal with uh, in our remaining time this morning? Well, thank you for a nice comment from um, Ms. Aurora. And uh, thank you from Swati Goyal. I'm very grateful for your, your comments. How about cultural modifications that should be embedded? Um, uh, that's actually a very good point, that there's a whole culture of science uh, that we have in medicine that needs to be introduced in policing. And that's part of the, uh, the task of um, the movement in the police profession worldwide for evidence-based policing. So uh, it's very, very uh, kind of you to spend the time with me, um, all 160 of you who are still uh, with us. Uh, and I, uh, I wish you all the best in uh, spreading the word about this and would be happy to continue discussions uh, with you all. Um, and uh, many, many kind remarks, uh, which uh, are very cheering on a day when the news is not so good uh, on policing in Britain and uh, the U US, I'm afraid. But uh, very, very nice words. Um, and I want to thank you uh, all again for being with us.